Jane and I were blessed to attend the North American Christian Convention a couple of weeks ago. It was in Cincinnati. For those of you who may not know, our Christian Convention is an annual four-day summer convention attracting several thousand Christians from across America as well as various parts of the world. Many speakers develop the theme, We Speak, in separate adult and youth and uh, children's conventions. And ours isn't one of those conventions where everybody sends a delegate and and you vote upon church policy for an entire denomination because each of our churches is independent of the other. It, it is a preaching, teaching convention that is designed to equip and empower and inspire God's people. And I kind of say that as, a, as an advertisement because next year it's in Anaheim, California, July 12th through the 15th, so make plans. You can plan a vacation around that. But just like we do here at New Hope, there's times when we had fun at the convention. And we had a guy, a Christian comedian, who was at the convention named Michael Jr. Has anybody ever heard of Michael Jr.? Anybody? Okay. You can Google him, go on YouTube, and and listen to some of his stuff. But I wanted to share with you just a small sample of of what Michael Jr. shared with us. Uh, And I'm going to begin here with kind of a, a jab, if you will, Uh, He's making fun of my home state of Nebraska here. So let's go ahead and run this. Now I get to travel doing comedy. It's a lot of fun traveling doing comedy. Sometimes I I used to have to go to small, like I was in Nebraska for some reason. um, (laughs) The plane was small. Like we got ready to land, and this is the sound I hear. The plane had a horn. What kind of plane got a horn? <laughs> and then the airports are odd. We went to one airport. We could, I go through the metal detector, right? And I don't hear nothing. Then this lady, security guard lady, looked at me and she said, beep. <laughs> that was you. I heard you. That was you. <laughs> She's like, beep. I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, it looked like you got something. So she said they got to use a wand on me. So I spread my arms out. Little dude named Juan came over and started frisking me. Little. <laughs> my family, I love being around family. A lot of people get on stage and in front of a lot of people, they don't like to show photos of their family because they want to be secret and they don't want to, you know. I'm cool with that. I'm, actually, I got a picture of my family right here if you want. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah, so that's us, man. Just... You can take it down now for people take a picture of it. <laughs> that's... That was comedy. I was just playing. That's not really them. Some people are like, wow, the little boy looks just like him. Today's text highlights what may have been the greatest Bible convention of all time even though the attendance was sparse. It certainly featured three of the most powerful speakers of all time. Moses, the one through whom the law had been given by God to his people. Elijah, who is perhaps the greatest of all of the Old Testament prophets. And Jesus, who came to fulfill both the law as well as everything the prophets had spoken about. They were three great deliverers. Moses delivered Israel out of bondage in Egypt. Elijah delivered Israel from bondage to many false gods. Jesus delivered lost and lonely people from bondage to their sin and to death. And after this brief convention, there was no doubt amongst those who were in attendance that day that Jesus is the Christ. After we learn about their experience today, There should be no doubt amongst us that Jesus is the Christ. If you want to take out your bullets and inserts, we're going to fill in the blanks there. Jesus' identity as the Son of Man, the, the Messiah sent from heaven by God, was confirmed, first of all, by what Jesus' disciples saw. And uh, again, we'll start with verse 2 of chapter 9 in Mark. Six days later, later from what? Well, from what we looked at last week, uh, where Jesus said, you are the Christ, you are the Son of God, where he acknowledged the identity of Jesus. Six days after this, 
Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed and his clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. Then Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. And Peter exclaimed, Rabbi, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And, and Peter said this because he didn't really know what else to say, for they were all terrified. Mark tells us that six days after Peter affirmed that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God, six days after Jesus had this talk with his disciples and this large crowd of people, describing to them the depth of the commitment required of those who would endeavor to be his disciples, Jesus takes Peter and James and John up on a mountain. We're not told why, just those three. We're not told why the other nine were excluded. What we do know is that those three were among some of the first uh, to hear Jesus' call to ministry. We do know those three uh, were able to witness some of Jesus' healings that others of the disciples were not privileged to see. We do know that <clears throat> those three were closest to Jesus when he went into the Garden of Gethsemane at the end of his life to pray. We do know their names usually appear at the top of any list of 12 uh, that we find in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. Now, as I told you, or I put there at the beginning, this account appears not only in Mark, but also in Luke and Matthew. And sometimes you get things from one gospel you may not get from another. Luke tells us that while Jesus was praying on the mountain, his appearance totally transformed before their eyes. Totally. Jesus' clothes became as Dazzling white and Matthew and or I'm sorry, Peter and James and John. They're in awe of what they see. Matthew adds that Jesus' face was as brilliant as the sun. And Jesus' appearance turned the, the whole mountain into the holy of holies. And while the three disciples are there gazing at what they are seeing. Who shows up but Moses and Elijah? And Luke tells us they were amazing in their appearance as well. And so Jesus and Moses and Elijah are carrying on a conversation amongst themselves and Jesus' three disciples, Peter, James, and John, are listening. Luke further says that Moses and Elijah were talking about Jesus' imminent departure from the earth. What's the natural reaction when we find ourselves basking in the mountains? Now, I've been in the mountains, and I tell you, you don't want to leave. Well, what's our natural reaction when we find ourselves with a, a mountaintop experience? Why, we want to stay in that experience as long as possible. And so Peter, as he so often does, blurts out things without even thinking about it. Peter says, Lord, how about we build you and Moses and Elijah, each of you, a shelter to stay in? Have you ever said something without even thinking about it and then gone, oh, that was dumb? <laughs> I have. <laughs> On many occasions. Or, or maybe you were in a conversation and somebody else says something and you're thinking to yourself, what did that have to do with the conversation? You been there? So, the other day, I'm jogging through the veterans' home. Now, jogging is a loose term. Trotting is probably a better term. Because as I'm going along, listening to my Christian music, this is probably about the pace I was going. <laughs> this young lady, I mean, scared me. She was going so fast that she's going by me. And furthermore, not only did she jog right by me like I'm standing still, she's pushing a baby in a cart while she's doing it. <laughs> Why don't you just juggle, too? That would make me feel good. 
And she turns around and she says, hi. And I said, oh, you know, not enough that you're going to show me up by breezing right by me. And then you've got to make me feel older by pushing a baby in a stroller. And she says, listen to this, she says, if it makes you feel any better, it's not my baby. <laughs> if you know why she thought that would encourage me, let me know afterwards, will you? I... Boom, so I'm watching her pushing that baby cart. I thought, like, maybe I should say, it's not my baby either, but that's, <laughs> that's not why I'm so slow. But anyway, back to the story. Sometimes we say things, we don't think about it, and that's what Peter does here. Now, if God was going to have anyone appear with Jesus on the mountain, why Moses? Why Elijah? Well, Moses represents the law. And, and Moses, in the book of Deuteronomy, predicted someday down in the future the coming of a great prophet. Now, we know that great prophet to be Jesus. Elijah represents the prophets, all of them, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Nahum, Habakkuk, and so on. He, Elijah represents all of those prophets who, who, in their predictions, they also spoke of this great prophet that Moses had talked about. So it only makes sense that the Messiah, who came to fulfill the law given by Moses, as well as all the predictions made by the prophets, it only makes sense that that he would appear with these two spiritual giants, and God was affirming before Peter, uh, James, and John all that he was doing through Jesus and all that he was going to do through Jesus. This is the man. I mean, that's kind of what he was saying. And as far as we know, this is the only time when Jesus revealed his glory while here on earth in this way. How profound of an experience would this have been? I mean, think about that. If you had been present, and you saw this, what kind of an impact would that have on you? I can tell you they never forgot this. And it would come in handy just a few years later when James would become the first of Jesus' disciples to be martyred. And John was the last of Jesus' disciples to die. We're told he went through severe persecution on the Isle of Patmos. But John would write just a few years later, we beheld Christ's glory, a glory that could only come from the Heavenly Father. And John was referring to this experience. Peter also went through severe persecution. In fact, tradition tells us that Peter was crucified upside down. And it would be Peter who would write, we were eyewitnesses of Christ's majesty. We were there. You better believe this had a profound impact upon them. But for now, what could they say? They're standing there in awe. The only thing I could think of is glory, glory, glory. The Apostle Paul wrote something that has to be tied to this event. Paul wrote, when God's Spirit is living in us, we, we are changed with ever-increasing glory into the likeness of Jesus Christ. When God's Spirit lives in us, there is a transformation that takes place in our character as well as our physical appearance. And people on the outside should see that happening. And he tells us how this happens, how the Holy Spirit changes us. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, we are transformed from the inside out by the renewing and the reprogramming of our minds. And he tells us in Philippians chapter 4 that when we meditate on God's truth, when we fill our minds with thoughts that are noble and just and true and lovely and pure and virtuous, God shapes us and molds us to act and behave more and more like Jesus Christ. We are transformed. And the world should see that transformation. 
And I would say to you that if our lives are not changing, if people are not seeing us increasing in our glory and our resemblance to that of Jesus Christ, then we must not be spending much time in God's Word. Because when we fill our minds with God's thoughts, the Holy Spirit will cause us to think more like God, and when we think more like God, we begin to act more like God. And if we're going to claim that we love Jesus Christ, then the Bible says we must live like Jesus. So the world better see that you and I are transforming before their very eyes. Those who know the before Christ had better see the after Christ look different. Does that make sense? So Jesus' identity is the Son of God, the Messiah sent from God, was confirmed by what Jesus' disciples saw in verses 2 through 6, and now in verses 7 through 10, we, it was confirmed by what Jesus' disciples heard. Uh, let's read there, beginning with verse 7. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved Son. Listen to Him. Suddenly, when they looked around, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus with them. As they went back down the mountain, Jesus told them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept it to themselves, but they often asked each other what he meant by rising from the dead. So Peter had no sooner offered to build shelters for Jesus and Moses and Elijah when this dark cloud overshadows Peter, James, and John, and God says from the cloud, this is my dearly loved son, listen to him. Peter is trying to tell Jesus, hey, why don't we build some shelters here? This is what I think we should do. And God says, listen to my son. In a sense, Peter is kind of saying that Moses and Elijah and Jesus, while they're all unequal, we'll, you know, we'll build a shelter for each of them. And God says, listen to my son. In fact, God no sooner says, listen to my son, and boom, Moses and Elijah are gone. As if to emphasize the point. The Hebrew writer tells us long ago in many ways and at many times, God's prophets in the Old Testament spoke his message to our ancestors, but now, but now, at last, God sent his son to bring his message to us. God created the universe by his son, and everything will someday belong to the son. God's son has all the brightness of God's own glory and is like him in every way. By his own mighty wor word, God's son holds the universe together. And that is why God said, this is my dearly loved son, listen to him. Matthew tells us in his gospel, this is a confirmation of a prophecy made by Isaiah 700 years earlier. Jesus' disciples first heard this same voice say this same thing. A couple years earlier, when Jesus had been baptized by John the Baptist, same thing. Peter would later write, we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes when, we received, when he received honor and glory from God the Father. The voice from the majestic glory of God said to him, this is my dearly loved son who brings me joy. I say that because we need to understand that Jesus Christ is more than just a great leader. He is more than just a good example. He is more than just a positive influence. He is more than just a great prophet. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And as the Son of God, we need to listen to Him. We need to obey Him and all that He tells us because His authority comes from God Himself. His authority is undeniable. And as wonderful as it was for Peter, James, and John to see Jesus transfigured before their very eyes, visions 
are not what we build our lives around. Discipleship is not determined or developed upon visions. It's built upon the unchanging Word of God. And Jesus is the Word of God. What Jesus says comes from God. God's instructions are just as relevant today for us as they were 2,000 years ago when God said, this is my dearly loved Son. Listen to Him. Don't listen to what the media tries to tell you. Don't listen to what some professor tells you if it it disagrees with what Jesus says. Don't listen to what the entertainment industry says. Listen to what Jesus says. Charles Colson was in Richard Nixon's cabinet, in the presidential cabinet, when he, he lied and ended up spending time in prison where he found Jesus Christ, and as a result of that, founded prison fellowship to reach prisoners for Jesus Christ. And he once said, and I quote, the people I've talked to say that the more they truly absorb Scripture, the more they seek to live by its precepts, the more they find God is able to accomplish His amazing purposes through their lives. Why did Jesus tell Peter, James, and John not to tell the other nine? Why would he say that? I don't know for sure, but I, I, I'm going to speculate because Jesus knew they still didn't fully understand what they had just seen. And if you don't fully understand what you've just seen, how could you possibly explain that to anyone else? You see, it would be not until after Jesus resurrected from the dead. It wouldn't be until after the Holy Spirit had been given to uh, his disciples that all of this they had seen would begin to make sense. Ah. Jesus' disciples may agree that he is the Messiah. He is the Son of God right now. But this whole death thing, what is this death? What is this dying? What is this resurrection stuff? It just didn't fit into their concept of what the Messiah should be. But after the resurrection, and after they received the Holy Spirit, then it would make sense. Jesus' identity as the Son of God, the Messiah sent from heaven by God, was confirmed by what Jesus' disciples saw, by what Jesus' disciples heard, and in verses 11 through 13, by what Jesus' disciples read. Then they asked him, Why do the teachers of religious law insist that Elijah must return before the Messiah comes? Jesus responded, Elijah is indeed coming first to get everything ready. Yet why do the scriptures say that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be treated with utter contempt? I tell you, Elijah has already come. And they chose to abuse him just as the scriptures predicted. They're confused. They had read the Old Testament. They were familiar with what the prophets had said. They knew what Malachi had said. Um, The prophet Malachi had said, Look, I am sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. His preaching will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. And every Jew should have known that. Every Jew should have known that Elijah would appear first to prepare the way for the coming of God's kingdom. So Jesus' disciples are thinking to themselves, well, we just saw Elijah, therefore God's kingdom must be very imminent. It must be coming soon. And in response, Jesus says, Elijah has already come. And they treated him as they have treated so many other of God's spokesmen. What did Jesus mean? Elijah has already come. In another place, Matthew tells us earlier that Jesus said, if you are willing to receive this truth, John the Baptist is the Elijah who is to come. Like Elijah, John the Baptist clothed himself in camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. John's preaching, John's style of ministry closely resembled that of Elijah. 
Furthermore, before John the Baptist was born, an angel appeared to his father, Zacharias, and said to Zacharias, Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. He will be a man with the spirit and the power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. And after John was born, Zacharias, his dad, said, You, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. So just work with me here through, through history. God used Moses to be God's spokesman to the Jewish people. Moses prepared the way for the other prophets who would come over the next few hundred years. And those prophets would then be spokesmen of God to his people. The most prominent of those prophets, the, most, the, the boldest of those prophets, was one named Elijah. Elijah called God's people to repent of their idolatry, to repent of their sin, and as a result of doing so, Elijah took a lot of abuse and persecution. And, and Elijah prepared the way for John the Baptist. 900 years after Elijah, John the Baptist comes along and he does the same thing. Once again, he calls God's people, the Jewish people, to repent of their idolatry, to repent of their sins, preparing the way for Jesus. Jesus died so that people might have a new relationship with God, a relationship built not on our, the works that we do, but upon God's grace and God's love. Jesus prepared the way for his church to do more than just bring about social change in the world. Jesus died so that his church might introduce to the earth the kingdom of God that was already in heaven and introduced kingdom lifestyles to the earth. And empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, the church of God then went forth and turned the world upside down for Jesus Christ, showed us what revival should look like. And what took place on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, what took place throughout the whole book of, of Acts is the standard by which the church of Jesus Christ should look like and be held today. And I share that with you because i got a question. Do we need revival today in America? Do we need revival at New Hope? Do you need revival in your home? Do you need revival in your marriage? Do you personally need revival? Jesus said that John the Baptist is the Elijah who, who was to come. And Jesus also said, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully, the King James Version says violently advancing, and forceful, violent men lay hold of it. In other words, only aggressive men and women moved by the heart of God and empowered by the Spirit of God can advance the kingdom of God. I'm telling you a watered-down gospel preached today from the pulpit. Lukewarm Christians occupying the same chairs may result. It may result in larger congregations, but that is not enough to advance forcefully the kingdom of God in the world today here on earth. It's not enough. God spoke through the prophet Ezekiel somewhere between 593 and 587 B.C. Now, Ezekiel was exiled from Judah, the land of Judah, to Babylon, hundreds of miles away, along with many of his countrymen, because Israel had wandered far from God. I mean, God puts up with a lot of rebellion puts up with a lot of sin on our part, but he's not going to put up with that forever. At some point in time, our sins are going to catch up with us. And they did. And so he used the evil empire of Babylon to overthrow Judah, and these people were exiled into the land of Babylon, and they had wandered so far from God. I mean, honestly, it's eerie how what they did then resembles what we're doing today in America. 
And the people were despondent. They were discouraged. Why has God abandoned us? What's, what's going to happen to us? And in that moment, God held out hope for them. I, I need to tell you, God always holds out hope. I don't care how bad it gets in your individual life. I don't care how bad it gets in your family or in the nation. God always holds out hope. If for no other reason, then he's God. And so God gave Ezekiel a vision of this valley filled with dead, dry bones. And God asked Ezekiel this question. Son of man, which is interesting because that's what Jesus is called in our text. Son of man, which is a whole other sermon. But God asked Ezekiel, son of man... Can these bones live? And Ezekiel said, Lord, you're the only one that knows the answer to that question. And God says to Ezekiel, speak to these dead bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And as Ezekiel spoke the word of God to these dead, dry bones, as Ezekiel preached the word of God to them, the bones began to rattle. And the bones began to come together and form skeletons. And upon those skeletons, muscles and flesh and skin appeared, and eventually God gave them life, breathed life into them. There's a reason I ask you, I beg you, the family at New Hope, to become self-feeders of the Word of God and not just dependent upon someone else to tell us what the Word does, to spiritually feed us. Our world is filled with spiritually dead people, people who resemble nothing more than dry bones, and many of them don't even know it. Our families, our churches, our nation, our world needs modern-day Elijahs, modern-day Ezekiels, modern-day John the Baptist who will boldly, unashamedly, lovingly speak the Word of God, which is eternal truth, into every environment God takes us. Because when we do, When you and I get the guts to speak the Word into the various environments there which God takes us, He will once again bring life into those environments where once there was no life. Ours is not to be concerned with the results. Ours is to be faithful to the task. In the early days of Christ's church, the Holy Spirit came upon Christ's believers in the Bible records for us in Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, they went everywhere preaching the Word. Who did? Just the apostles? No. God's people went everywhere preaching the Word. And Christianity spread throughout much of the world in rapid succession like a fire. And it continued that way for a while. And over the next few centuries, God's people became ignorant of God's Word. They depended upon the leaders to tell them what the Word said. And when those leaders were greedy, selfish, thirsty for power, began to tell God's people things that were not true, the church fell away. John Huss was one of the first reformers who challenged the church of his day to prove prove its practices from Scripture. He was burned at the stake by the church because he dared to call God's people back to biblical faithfulness. For the next 200 years, those who agreed with them, with him, those who sought to build their lives upon the Bible were also persecuted, tortured, they ran, they were imprisoned, many of them died. 200 years. 
And then one day, they found refuge in Hernhut, Germany, on the estate of a 27-year-old Christian named Count Nicholas Zinzendorf. On Wednesday morning, August 13, 1727, God miraculously poured out His Holy Spirit on these Moravian Christians that started a revival the likes of which the world had not seen since the first century. This tiny church began a continuous prayer chain using relays of men and women that lasted for a hundred years. In the first 25 years, over a hundred from this small church, over a hundred of these Moravian Christians sent out, set out as missionaries first to North America, to the Native American Indians here in North America, to the cold shores of Greenland, to Africa, and South America, every country in Europe and every country in Asia. This tiny band of believers sent out more missionaries in 25 years than all the rest of the entire Protestant church put together over the previous 200 years. Their movement is credited for inspiring the missionary efforts of great men like William Carey, John and Charles Wesley, among others. In fact, I would encourage you to go home and Google Moravian Christians or Moravian revival and see what happened. Why? Can anyone tell me why New Hope Christian Church, filled with mighty prayer warriors, fueled by God's powerful spirit, emboldened by God's divine mission, is there any reason we cannot be a catalyst for a modern-day Moravian revival? The move of God's spirit then and the move of God's spirit now are not the product of chance or of time, but of God. One of the unalterable truths of life is this. Preparation of the people of God always precedes revival amongst the people of God. Now, let me repeat that. Preparation of the people of God always precedes revival amongst the people of God. And that preparation requires prayer. It requires repentance. It requires people consumed with rightly living before God. And as you and I know the Word of God, it gradually changes us. We begin to say things and do things that we never would have thought about. Jane and I uh, attended a, a wedding <clears throat> yesterday at a Catholic church, and this priest nailed it, the message. He nailed it. And as I, as I listened to him talk about honoring your wife, I, I, w I was convicted. I, and I, I, I told Jane, I said, man, I, I have to ask your forgiveness. I've not honored you in the way that I need to. And I can tell you, five years ago, I wouldn't have thought of that. I didn't say that. Ten years ago, I'm just saying that the more that we expose ourselves to the Word of God, the more that God begins to change us and transforms us. And the world ought to be able to see that transformation. That's what I'm saying. And so my question now, right now, is this. Do we really, do we really want revival? I mean, really. Are we personally preparing for a revival by laying aside some of the sins that have been holding us down? And there may be distractions in our lives that aren't sinful, but they're keeping us from focusing on that which we really need to, 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 to live holy. Are we personally praying for revival? 
It is my prayer that each of us and all of us be a modern-day Moses, a modern-day Elijah, a modern-day John the Baptist preparing the way of the Lord for the people the Lord puts us in contact with so the Lord can do great things in their lives as well as ours. It's my prayer that each of us, like Ezekiel, would know the Word of God and speak the Word of God into every place that we go because when we do, God will breathe life into those people where there was no life. 